Hey y'all. What's up, Vertical Family? Pastor Joe and Pastor Josh here, chatting with you. This is our first time doing a Facebook Live, uh, just in general, for both of us, I yeah. guess. So, um, can guarantee we're going to laugh at ourselves, so feel free to laugh at us as we go, as, as this uh, probably will get awkward at certain points, uh, hopefully not too terribly so. Um, but we also want to uh, do this so that we can be with you as much as we're, we're able right now and, and interact with you in a way that is as intimate as we can uh, while we're quarantined to our homes. Um, and so our, our goal in this is to, to interact with questions that you've sent us or topics that you've asked us to talk about uh, over the past week. Um, thank you guys for, for, for those of you who sent things in to us. Uh, we really appreciate the thought that you gave and, and the, the way you guys are thinking about um, what the church is and how we are called to uh, live during this time. Um, so, disclaimer too, yeah. being that this is a live video and we can't edit it out, uh, well you should, something you should know about Joe and I's relationship, uh, we have a, a habit of picking on one another, uh, and so if some of that comes comes out in these videos, know that uh, it's all done in fun and driven from love. Uh, also, being that we don't have time to really talk through uh, all the particulars of what we intend to say. If Joe and I ever disagree, just know that Joe is wrong and, <laughs> and that, that I'm right. That's a so, safe bet. Yeah, I safe think that's bet. how you usually that's, that's the way you roll, roll it out. Uh, just as a quick reminder before we jump into the topics, uh, the website, uh, vertchurch.com slash vertical dash online. That's got everything that we're doing right now to, to try to stay connected, to try to keep living as a church. Um, that's where we're putting everything. We've, we've obviously been communicating via email and social media as well. Um, but if you have any questions or if you're looking for, for ways to serve your community or serve the church, or if you know someone who has a need or if you have a need, there's, there's a form you can fill out there. Uh, we have doubled our benevolence budget for the sake of the church and for the sake of our community so that we can meet needs. Um, so please don't, don't be afraid to reach out and ask if you have things uh, that you know uh, our needs in, in your life or your family or, or the family lives of those people around you. Um, we also would ask that you continue to check Facebook and Instagram and your email and the website. Uh, please read the communication that we are sending out. Um, we, we try really hard not to over communicate, not to send things that are unnecessary. So if we've sent something out, we, we think it's worth saying uh, and we think it'll be valuable to you. So we'd ask that you uh, just continue to check those means of communication for, for updates and, and for anything that we, we think is worth, worth saying and worth communicating to you guys. Uh, we want to start with quick updates on, on our lives and, and let you know how we're doing. So Josh, how you doing, man? Uh, big picture. Um, family is healthy. We're all healthy, doing well. Uh, enjoying some of the extra time that we get to be with one another uh, and being that my schedule uh, is a, a little bit more flexible and there's some space there I've been able to catch up on a lot of my uh, reading assignments for uh, seminary and uh, spend a lot more time around the dinner table with the family which is is always pretty awesome uh, and uh, also been spending a lot more time in my pajamas which is <laughs> Uh, pretty pretty amazing that confession. I don't know if I should say this, but uh, on the video we sent out for uh, oh gosh last last Sunday, uh, it only showed me from the the top up, and I was rocking a nice polo, looking studly as always. But uh, what you didn't see under the desk is I was rocking my plaid pajama pants and bedroom slippers. Uh, so I won't do that next week now though, because I don't want to be distracted and you all thinking about what I'm wearing, but. I was talking to Jonathan Mears after Sunday, and he actually said he thought you'd lost some muscle mass. So uh, there's the camera angle. <laughs> that's right. That's the camera was. angle, dude. That's what I'm getting swole, for yeah. sure. Your boys also made a sweet fort. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the creative things that we've been trying to do indoors is uh, look for things that we can do. And one of the things that we did is we made a pretty epic uh, cardboard fort, thanks uh, to my sister-in-law, who had some cardboard uh, that they can get in. It's got lights. It's got different rooms. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty sweet it for sure. Sweet. It is sweet. Uh, for us, Lucy uh, makes a huge difference having an eight-month-old who's learning how to crawl, learning how to make noises. Uh, I'm 
pretty sure she said dad at first. No way, dude. But I'll let my wife decide that. Um, but she's she's been a huge help as far as staying sane and, and trying to figure out um, things to do while we're inside. She she keeps us pretty entertained. Um, but but honestly, uh, it's been a great time of family devotion. Logan and I, our, our schedules often don't overlap when she's teaching all the the day and then I have meetings a lot of evenings and so it's been really nice to get to read scripture together to yeah. pray together more regularly to have set times where we are doing that together um, and so that's been a huge encouragement and, and a big uh, sort of life-giving thing that's that's happened as a result of being stuck inside um, but we also haven't really been stuck inside the weather's been getting nicer so yeah. we've gotten to go out a lot put the hammocks up in the backyard go on walks those kind of things uh, watch the dogs run around and jump all over each other and um, I've gotten the guitar out getting some calluses back on my fingers nice. hopefully which is nice and did some wo woodworking yeah delivered my brother-in-law a ramp for his shed today so you're welcome yeah you're welcome Scott uh, but just just trying to uh, continue to be creative continue to figure out ways to uh, love my family and, and reach out to my neighbors. I think that's been some things that have kept me uh, from getting too bogged down yeah. while being <laughs> under quarantine. I'd love to hear what you guys are doing too. Uh, I'm not reading the comments, but even if we read them back later, uh, to try to maintain some sanity if you're spending a lot of time indoors. Um, one of the things, other things that we're doing, so in addition, obviously we're trying to get outside, like Joe was saying, as much as possible and think of creative things we can do inside. Another thing that's been helpful, I think, is trying to limit the amount of time spent watching uh, the news or reading articles uh, about the coronavirus or even on social media. Um, I think it can easily, at least for me, default become kind of obsessive, you know. Um, and so I think staying informed is, is good and important, but uh, if we're not careful, I think it can just dominate all of our thoughts, our conversations. It can be all about Dorona, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and I don't know. If that's the most helpful thing. I think some of us need to social distance ourselves from social media and that's really uh, right. you know figure out what a, what a healthy healthy balance looks like there. I think another huge piece for me that's helped with the, the just maintaining uh, uh, some sanity is is really kind of you're hanging that that prayer time. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. I think this whole uh, this whole thing's been a bit overwhelming for me at times. Uh, everything, not so much the, the the thought of what this means for my health or my family, but more so just like how how do we effectively shepherd uh, our ch church and and the people that we can't gather with and can't see face to face. Uh, and so everything that we knew as normal has kind of been flipped around. Hence, like this live video. So trying to rethink everything that we do is sometimes stressful, but um, it's nice to be able to bring those worries and those concerns to the Lord and it, it acknowledge our insufficiency and in, in, in rest in his for sure. Yeah. So s people are saying that we need to talk louder. Man, so, I don't know. It's a, it's a scream. Just start screaming. Uh, we'll try to speak up. Yeah. Uh, start projecting a little bit better. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. I need uh, my face. Maybe mic. give us a thumbs up. Yeah, we got to get the mics next time. Uh, give us a thumbs up if we're doing okay. Um, but one of the things, one of the sort of phrases that's been thrown around a bunch in the world right now is that the uncertain times, we are living in uncertain times. Um, and so we wanted to interact with that phrase and, and think about uh, the implications of, of calling this time uncertain, uh, what, what that means and how we can interact with that sort of ideal as Christians. So if you want to yeah. jump into that, go for it. Well, I think obviously there are some things that are uh, uncertain. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty that is felt um, regarding, you know, the economy, for example. Uh, a lot of people are wondering, um, you know, with businesses closing and the stock market the way that it is, are we heading towards another Great Depression? And obviously that has implications not just for, for us on kind of the grand scale, but even as individuals. What is that going to mean for my own uh, personal financial situation uh, what does that gonna mean for my career my job or my income and do I have enough to to get by uh, there's uncertainty about uh, the education system and there's a lot of questions there like what what all this is gonna mean obviously schools are shut down um, spoiler if you're not paying attention at all um, 
And, and so, uh, you know, what does that mean for the summer? What is that? Are they going to try to do something with the school year? Uh, when are these, these kids going, going to go back? Uh, and what is that going to look like? How do we educate our children now in, in the midst of, of all that? And the uncertainty of it, you know, man, I hope my kids aren't going to be, you know, set up for failure because maybe parents that feel unequipped uh, to, to do the task are kind of being thrust into it. Uh, or can't do it at all because both parents are gone uh, working and they're in childcare or somewhere else. Obviously, there's uncertainty about our health. You know, will we get sick? Will you know? Will will we? You know, worst case scenario, will, would someone one of us die? Um, but at some level, I feel like these uncertainties have always been there. Um, that's always been a thing. You know, I was reminded of James uh, four uh, thirteen fourteen, where it says, "Come now, you who say, you know, today or tomorrow, we're gonna." We're going to do this or that, and we're going to start this business, and this is how it's going to go. Uh, and he, uh, you know, applies that sort of rebuke and saying, you, you don't, you don't know what tomorrow holds, right? We're not God, and he's not he's saying we shouldn't plan, but this whole idea that we can be certain of what tomorrow holds for us in terms of our uh, circumstances, our life, our finances is, is, is foolish. I think people are just feeling it more acutely now that some of those things are being threatened uh, uh, to to be taken away or stripped away from us. Um, and sort of that grand illusion of I know what tomorrow holds is being shattered and I think that's unsettling for, for a lot of people so. yeah my dad coming in strong with the, uh, the comment it's been uncertain since Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord God boom mm-hmm. dude we can just stop Facebook yeah. live right yeah. now <laughs> where's Jack Hall <laughs> yeah. Jack Hall yeah so uh, in what ways so, so we've talked about how things are uncertain in what ways are things not uncertain yeah I think we've been trying to get at some of this uh, in the the last two worship guides in particular. Um, so obviously, you know, some of this might be reiterating the same stuff, but uh, we know for certain that God is in control. Uh, and so while we might not know what the future holds, uh, it might sound corny, but we know who holds the future. It's like that song. Uh, what is that song? Because he lives, mm-hmm. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Uh, because I know that he holds... The future, and so uh, as Christians, we are we are certain that God uh, reigns, that He rules, that He is sovereign uh, over all of this, uh, and that no one is strong enough to dethrone Him, and, and even more that He uses all of that uh, that authority and that power for the good of of His people, and so uh, we can obviously you know know that with full certainty. Uh, another thing that kind of lends itself to is this idea that salvation, our salvation. Is, is secure, and we're trying to get at that with the whole God being for us and nothing can separate us from, from the love of Christ. That you know, we are you know, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit as believers, Ephesians 1, and we, no, nothing can you know, pluck us from the Father's hand. Uh, there's all these, these, these scriptures that we could point to that, that are meant to comfort uh, the Christian uh, and let them know in maybe uncertain times that there is one certainty, and that is that our salvation is, is secure in Christ. And, um, both of those things married together reminds me of uh, one of my favorite John Calvin uh, quotes is, he says, seeing that a pilot, referring to God, uh, steers the ship in which we sail, uh, who, will, who will never allow us to perish, even in the midst of shipwrecks, we have no reason to be overwhelmed with fear or overcome by weariness. And I love that idea uh, that because God is, is at the helm of our ship and our lives, he is in control um, and because our salvation is is sure that even in the midst of shipwrecks we cannot ultimately perish you know perish because our our eternity is safe and we don't have to you know feel so overwhelmed um, by fear and or just uh, being over you know with with worry um, because uh, those those two things are are steadfast and, and unchanging. In fact, I love that quote so much. I, I want to I want it's my new to my new uh, tattoo idea is to get get a ship. <laughs> Uh, in a storm, uh, as a kind of reminder of, of that, that quote. Um, You've been thinking about that for a while. For a minute. Yeah. Uh, Tis not about it. So <laughs> I've been rebuking her. Get behind me, Satan. That's right. Um, in fact, it would be helpful if you guys would comment in there. You're just your affirmation that I should get oh boy. Uh, a tattoo of a ship. You're on, opening, on opening yourself up to uh, all kinds of comments now. So. Um, I think the other thing, too, that, that came to mind in thinking about the the certainty of, of our lives right now still, um, is that this hasn't changed our story. Mm. Um, God has, has known this was coming. Uh, you know, everybody likes to say he had, this isn't a surprise to God that the coronavirus is a thing. 
Um, and so, so we, we live uh, with uncertainty from our perspective. But we have certainty, like you said, in God and who He is, and, yeah. and His sovereign hand over our lives, knowing yeah. that this was this was in the pages of our of our story uh, of the story of our lives the whole time. Yeah. Uh, just because we didn't know it was coming doesn't mean that that God is somehow playing catch up now. That yeah. oh no, <laughs> got to figure out how yeah, to yeah. keep these people <clears throat> alive. Piper talks about it in terms of like God's not an ambulance driver; He shows up on the scene. Uh, like everything's all broken and busted up and he's like let me figure out how to you know fix this but he's more like a surgeon you know he's using a scalpel to sometimes cut us but it's for ultimate healing and kind of that idea like we this story we know the end of the story too so we know that not only is God in control in the here and now and and that uh, our salvation is secure but that that restoration that that consummation renewal is coming yeah. Um, yeah. because we've been kind of given a, a sneak peek. He's pulled back the curtain and showed us uh, what is to come in the future. So in some sense, we do know what the future holds ultimately. Yeah. Um, and that's that Jesus is going to come, and the king uh, will reign fully and finally on a renewed creation. And you know, this creation now that is subjected to futility, where there is viruses, uh, is going to be liberated from the curse, and, and that will be no more, and we will forever dwell in the presence of God and what an amazing day uh, that will be and I think that really shapes and I've said this before in kind of we were preaching like the way we view our present struggles uh, in fact last night my neighbor um, was was talking about watching reruns of sports because uh, I guess I don't follow sports anyway so sports I guess oh, they got them all nicks, dude yeah. they're, they're gone so he's watching an old uh, Manny Pacquiao fight and he'd already seen it before and he knew that he he wins in the end and he's just saying how it's you know interesting to watch the fight knowing the outcome yeah. already, right. and and for the Christian life is very very similar to that. Like you know, there's times where we face hardship, we receive you know striking blows, if you will, um, and it might feel like defeat, but we know that's not that's not the outcome at the end. We we know that in the end we win. Jesus reigns, yeah. and and um, all all will be well. So, yeah. my dad says you should tattoo it on your heart. I like that sentimental. That's you know. right. So uh, uh, I also think Tish should get a full back piece of my face. Oh boy! Yeah, just you're gonna, you you are already not winning in the comments, and now you're really <laughs> gonna be losing. Uh, but that that brings us to sort of the second idea. Um, I, I think that knowing knowing the outcome, knowing our future hope, the the hope that we have, who whose we are. Um, uh, one of the questions, thanks Megan Myers for, for sending this to us. Um, what does it look like to choose joy in these circumstances? So, so let's start. What, what does that mean to choose yeah. joy? Well, I think what it, maybe what it doesn't mean first is uh, it, it doesn't mean that we ignore um, or dismiss suffering or pain or real tragedy around us. So it's, there's this kind of notion in culture that, um, that maybe we just need to be positive and not think or talk about it, right? And so I don't want to think about this bad stuff, and so let's just, you know, turn turn our eyes and just think positive thoughts. Yeah, I'm just going to put good vibes out there. Right, just the good vibes, <laughs> man. Um, but as Christians, we can readily acknowledge, you know, pain and the hardship and suffering all around us, uh, and, and yet there is this, this unshakable hope and, and gladness of heart that really transcends our circumstances. And so we can... Uh, we were talking about this a few minutes earlier, we can mourn um, over hardship while simultaneously right. rejoice in a God who, who works all things out uh, for good. And, and there's, that, there's that idea that both can be present. And I think it's 2 Cor you know, Corinthians 6, I believe, you have to check me on that, uh, is where he talks about being sorrowful but always rejoicing uh, right. at, at the same time. Uh, but I think bound up in that question is the assumption that joy is a, is a choice at some level, uh, it must be, I guess, because it's commanded uh, of us. Uh, we see this all over the pages of, of the Bible. Uh, we see this in the Old Testament, uh, especially in the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 149 two talks about um, you know, the, the city of Zion, the people of Zion, Israel, rejoice and be glad in your king. And, and we see all, th all throughout the New Testament, Romans 12, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, Philippians 3, 1 Thessalonians by this idea of rejoice always, uh, rejoice in suffering, consider it all joy, my brothers, yeah. when I grieved are by various trials. Uh, and so at some level, uh, it, it, there is a response here. But here's the, the interesting thing about joy is that it's, in, it's only possible uh, with, with God. And so it's not this idea of, 
And, you know, we just need to try to try harder to be joyful, but we have to kind of pursue it indirectly mm-hmm. um, because much like patience or, you know, peace, joy is one of the fruits of, of the spirit. Uh, and, and so uh, it's, it's really found in less in trying harder to be joyful and more in let me fix my gaze, uh, the gaze of, of my eyes and my heart on, on Christ and, and be reminded of, of his promises and spend time walking by his spirit and the, the outcome of that is, is, is a joyful, joyful heart. Yeah, seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added yeah. to you. I think that's that not only applies to material things, but I think it applies to, to the things that we want uh, yeah. as far as how we uh, perceive what's going on in the world around us. Too. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote this, I copied this quote down from C.S. Lewis in his book, Surprised by Joy. He said this, he said, uh, you can search the world for joy and not find it, but when you're busy living your life in right relationship with God and loving Jesus sacrificially, Joy sneaks up behind you and surprises you. Yeah. Uh, in other words, maybe the secret to finding joy is to stop looking for it mm-hmm. and, and instead uh, to look to Christ and to rest in His finished work and to uh, concern yourself with, with His kingdom. Yeah. And I think joy is the inevitable outcome of, of that. Yeah, and, and why is it important that we as Christians choose joy? Why does that matter? Yeah. Well, on the most basic level, I think obedience matters, right? So as Christians, uh, we we come under the lordship of another, and uh, he's the true and rightful king who is lord of all, uh, and we simply decide we're going to stop living in rebellion to that and be submissive to his lordship. And we know that he's a good lord, and so his commands are not burdensome. And so at some level, I think maybe at the most basic level, uh, we sh- you know this matters because obedience matters. Uh, but I think as you look beyond that, um, I think... Uh, people matter. Um, Paul in in First Thessalonians three talks about how uh, the Thessalonians and how they endured uh, hardship with contentment and and joy uh, really encouraged him in his own yeah. uh, affliction. And I think the same is true. I think we've probably experienced that. Uh, I know I've experienced that even watching you. You know, walk through through hardship and maintain uh, that sort of qu- quietness of soul and that settled confidence in God, even in the, the face of hardship, how that encourages me, um, both in my walk with Christ and when I go through suffering, I can recall those moments. Um, I think maybe the, the most important thing, the, the glory of God matters, you know, uh, and as representatives of God, you know, we are communicating something uh, in the way that we respond to, to hardship. And so we have to ask ourselves, are, you know, are we saying with, with our lives and our actions are we, that God is enough in, in this? Are we communicating uh, a false message? Uh, which leads to that. The, the, the fourth thing I was thinking of is our obviously our Christian Christian witness. Yeah, I think now, perhaps, I don't say more than ever, but in a long time, um, we have an opportunity to really show the world what uh, an unshakable joy and confidence in God looks like. Uh, and um, and probably perhaps maybe now more than ever, at least in our generation, um, people are looking to the testimony of the church to see how how we respond. And so it's a it's a heavy responsibility, but it's also a pretty you know beautiful opportunity I think we have uh, in this particular season. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the reasons that we have been pushing that the idea that we are still the church. Yeah. Um, just because we can't gather at the school every Sunday with all 200 of our brothers and sisters yeah. doesn't mean that God's call, our identity in Jesus has, has changed. Um, and so, so how that, that brings us to our last, our last topic that we're going to cover, which, which is kind of a lot, but how, how do we live, uh, as Christ followers, despite all the craziness that's going on, uh, and, and all the, the changes in our circumstances, um, and we're gonna we're gonna interact with that, and and I want to start just by talking about how how we can do that at home, um, and sort of use that growing uh, concentric circles yeah. to, to sort of define how how do we live uh, as Christ followers? How do we show our Christian witness to the people around us? Um, and I think one of the things that that has been really uh, encouraging to me and and convicting to me, honestly, uh, is to see how different my my mindset is and my perspective on how I do things at home has been um, now that I've been confined to being at home. 
Um, I think I, I had allowed myself to be really busy doing ministry and, and allowed that to make me complacent about how I lead my family and how I uh, interact with um, not only Logan, but also with Lucy. Um, yeah. And so I think one of the ways that, that we would really encourage all of you, and, and we've been seeking to do this with our families, is, is leading our families in, in worship together. And when I say that, I don't mean just playing music and singing, although I do mean that in yeah. part. Um, but reading scripture, praying together, um, that's, that's the entire reason that we've come up with these worship guides is, is so that we can equip you to do that in your homes with uh, your, your family, if you have it, or your neighbors or your roommates or, or those people who you feel uh, you wouldn't be going against uh, the, the guidelines uh, or the, the rules uh, to gather with them on a Sunday. Um, By the way, we measured. We're six yeah, feet. Yeah, we are. From, from close. face to face, close. <laughs> we got the distance, um, and then I think um, prayer. I, th- I mean, we are called to pray for not only our brothers and sisters, but for the lost, and and that certainly hasn't gone away. And that's mm-hmm. something we can do without going anywhere. Um, so I think um, the idea that uh, Cliff from Movement Church shared with Logan, and Logan shared with me, the first voice has been a really big uh, encouragement in in my life. Just who, whose voice do I hear first when I wake up in the morning? Is it uh, social media? Is it my email? Is it my text messages? Or do I set aside time right when I roll out of bed to pray, to read scripture, to hear from the Lord? Um, and that can change the the complete trajectory of my day uh, yeah. if I do that well. Um, and then I think for those of you who have kids or for those of you who have nieces and nephews or for those of you who have young neighbors uh, who you've connected with um i think this is a a unique and special time that we've been given to intentionally disciple the the young kids uh in our lives um they're not in school all day Mm -hmm. so they have way more time um and you probably most of you are working from home or working uh sort of in between home and the office more often than usual um and if anything else, you're, you're at least probably not going out as much in the evenings. So you've been given extra time around the kids in your life. Um, and it doesn't always, discipleship doesn't always have to look like, all right, let's sit down and do it to the glory of God, right? So, so we can do the simplest thing, like, like building a cardboard fort, uh, to, to interact with your kids in a way that shows them the, the love of Christ, the leadership of Christ, what it looks like to be a good father or uh, to be a, a brother. Um, I think those are, are really great ways that we can encourage our, our families and our communities even without leaving our own home. Yeah. I think, too, on that note, like the, um, one, take advantage of the stuff Anna's putting. A shout out to Anna, man, for the, that yeah, awesome, that was uh, awesome. Kind of activity she put together and the questions, super helpful. Um, but also, like, I think now we talked about being an amazing opportunity to display our witness to a watching world, but like, and as it relates to family, I think if your children are older, too, uh, using this as an opportunity to speak to them about what's going on, their fears, their worries, and, and why we do have hope. And not just why we have hope, but why we do the things that we do. And so if you're doing uh, something to serve your neighbors in light of what's going on, taking the time to explain why you're doing those things yeah. matters. I mean, it's important they see you do it. Yeah. But it's also important, especially if they, they're old enough where they can understand at some level, of this is why we do these things. We serve because we've been served yeah. by Jesus and connecting those those uh, those theological dots for them, and that this is the impetus for our obedience. We don't do this just to feel good. We don't do this because um, you know we we feel we have to. We get to do this, and and we do it with glad hearts because this is what we've received uh, yeah. from from the Lord. Yeah, that's really good, and that takes us to sort of the broadening circle of the community. So uh, this is an ever changing target it seems like right now yeah. uh with all the different rules and regulations that are being put in place seemingly daily um but i do think there are certain ways that that we can be christian witnesses to our community um even even th- despite the the s- regulations or guidelines that, that have been given um because we do want to honor those things we don't want to be um sort of brazen and disrespectful but we want to submit to the authority that God has placed over us and and behave in a way that that shows that we value the lives of the people around us um, I think that's a huge piece of witnessing yeah. Christ uh, 
And but I do think there are certain things that we can do practically that that more than just hiding and staying away from the people around us uh, as far as keeping them healthy. Um, but I think there are certain things that we can do uh, that would that would show the love of Christ actively to our community. Um, one of those things that that comes to mind right away is sacrificial service and giving. Um, so that can look a lot of different ways depending on what your neighborhood looks like or depending on uh, what your resources are, what means you have of yeah. doing that. Um, but I think I think in this time, um, being sacrificial is clearly not the norm. Uh, the norm is let's yeah. stock up on everything, let's get everything we can get our hands on, and and hoard that up for ourselves. Um, so maybe it's just as simple as I'm going to the grocery store. I'm going to go knock on my neighbor's doors and say, Hey, I'm going to the store. Do you need something? Yeah. Um, not instead of I'm gonna go get everything yeah, I can. Yeah. None of you fools get nothing. Yeah. Um, George Moore put out a, uh, and I dropped the ball, George. I forgot to respond till just now. Uh, sorry, I love you. <laughs> um, there's an article he put out on the the Slack. It's on Gospel Coalition yeah. that has like a little uh, thing you can actually print out and hand out to your neighborhood. You yeah. know, uh, which essentially says like, Hey, this is who I am. This is where I reside. Uh, if you need help getting groceries or supplies or essentials or just want prayer, you know. Um, I'm, I'm the person you can contact for, for that. So I thought that was a really cool, practical way you can get it, like, how do I serve other people around me? Yeah, and we'll put that link up on the on the website so that you can get to it easily if you want to do that. Yeah. Um, but then I think that, that leads to the next thing, which is, is letting if you let people know where you live, there's a chance they might show up at your door uh, yeah. and say, I, I really need food tonight, or I don't, I don't know where I'm going to get any more toilet paper or something like that. Um, and so being hospitable, not having a door that's that's locked and, and unfriendly, but within the the bounds of what's um, safe and what's uh, acceptable uh, with the social distancing that we've been asked to do, um, being hospitable, allowing people to come to your home and, and be served and be loved yeah. and, and not be received in a spirit of fear. I think uh, there's a big difference between willingly and yeah. and lovingly being hospitable and doing it because you, you've been told that you should now and yeah. and doing it fearfully um but we haven't been given the spirit of fear we've been given the spirit of power and and that's not because we're amazing it's because yeah. of the gospel um and so being willing to meet the needs of those around you uh what even if that means welcoming them into your home yeah uh and and serving them that way um and then I think one one last way that we can reach our community is um, being being aware of the needs that are going on even outside of our own neighborhoods. So uh, on the website we have the Henrico County Food Drive, Chesterfield County Food Drive. Uh, I know Casey Barden is working to set us up with uh, a food drive in Mechanicsville area, North Side, um, and and so I think being aware of those needs and seeking to meet them so uh, maybe none of your neighbors need need extra food when you go to the grocery store well i know at least three food banks that really do need it yeah um so so be aware of that and look for opportunities to meet those needs instead of um just sort of sticking yeah. our head in the sand and and hoping that somebody else takes care of it yeah just creative things too like i think that's what the, the a lot of this has come down right. we gotta get really creative sometimes about how we we tangibly love other people around us, but even I think about moms uh, who maybe are home, uh, who are already teaching their children. Uh, maybe even if you got a neighbor or a friend that uh, does not have that um, that opportunity because of work, and their kid is not able, you know, maybe you know, allowing them to be a part of what you're already doing. Yeah, uh, it might be maybe a good way to. I mean, there's there's obviously there's no one size fits all, but the the idea is that we're to to move towards people with compassion. Um, and I think it's, I think it's been really, e it's really easy right now to not try. Um, it would be really easy and socially acceptable to sit on your couch and do nothing mm. and no one would know and everybody would praise you for not leaving yeah. your house. Um, yeah, because even the food bank thing, right? So like right. worldly wisdom says that I shouldn't do any of that mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, the best thing for, for my own self-preservation uh, is to, to limit all of that. Um, but, and... I think there's there's merit. Like even we think about the, what love looks like, biblically yeah. speaking, is this: I'm going to seek your good, even at great cost to myself. 
and, and over I think, and over again. And I think that's the picture that we have to do. And obviously, there's a difference between uh, just having a play date and like doing something sacrificial, and moving towards people in love, and to meet a real need, even if it means you you get sick. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that we're still called to do, uh, with or without you know a quarantine. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for those of you who don't see it in the comments, Josh Sadler says he's got the, the hookup on toilet paper. Nice. And Stephen Casper reminds us that giving blood is also another way. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a, a huge way. need right now that we can we can meet uh, as long as we haven't been out of the country. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, th- thanks for those reminders, guys. That's awesome. Um, and that brings us to sort of like a, a third circle, which is social media. So So that's... Not quite uh, as broad as everybody, but but a little bit broader than than our local community. Yeah. So how can we be Christian witnesses on social media? Just log off. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> except Thursdays at seven p.m. Wednesdays, you know, Wednesdays, Wednesdays. Wednesday. whatever today is. <laughs> Wednesday at seven. Uh, now, uh, yeah. So I think you know our witness carries goes with us wherever we go, right? And mm-hmm. and and in the technological world that we live in, social media is one of those places where we uh, are you know, bearing the name of Christ and, and, and have a witness, whether it's positive or negative. And so, um, and a lot of people are jumping on there to post. And I'm just going to say the meme game has been strong. Uh, throughout, <laughs> That's for sure. Throughout That's some for of sure. This. Um, but uh, when I, th- I was thinking through two, two passages that came to mind to, that I think serve as helpful grids and when we think about what to post and what not to post. Uh, and one of them was in Ephesians, I think it's three, where uh, Paul is talking about let no corrupt talk or uh, unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And I think, uh, when, at least when I and just read that, I think a lot of people think about it, they immediately think... I'm not going to cuss. Yeah, no four-letter yeah. words. And I think that's probably included in that. But um, then he goes on, you know, we, keep, we talk about context, right? We keep reading. And he, he describes unwholesome speech as speech that does not uh, build up others yeah. uh, and isn't a means of grace to those to hear it. And so I think we have to think through not just is what I'm about to say or post true. I mean, that, that should be there too, right? We should be people of integrity, not spreading lies or, or just rumors. Um, but is it true is not far enough. We need to ask, does this actually build others up? Is it helpful in that? Uh, and, and is this a means of grace to those who hear it? Or is it simply just inciting more fear, panic, or actually lack uh, of faith? And so that's one kind of filter, I think, yeah. that... Um, we should think through uh, in the way that we interact with social media. Another passage that came to mind was in Philippians 4, where Paul's closing the letter, uh, and he's talking about, uh, you know, whatever is is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is lovely, whatever is worthy of praise, let's set our our minds on those things. Um, Now, I don't think, you know, I don't want to stretch that too far in saying Paul is saying what we are, you know, just saying we shouldn't do a minute ago, like let's just ignore all the bad stuff. But I think there... uh, not just positive thinking, like thinking about what is was beautiful and lovely and pure should should characterize us, but also in what we say, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think should be characterized by those things, because I think as Christians we should be good news people. Yeah. Not saying we can't acknowledge the reality of the bad news, but the theme, the overarching theme of the things that we say should be filled with hope and and, and good news. And I don't just mean that in the strictest sense of just talking about the gospel, but. Um, we should be characterized as people who, who, who love to focus on uh, the beautiful and the good things and the hopeful things uh, that can really encourage and help other people. So, Yeah, one thing my dad shared with me when I was younger was, uh, I can't remember where he heard this. I want to say it was Billy Graham, but don't quote me on that. It's a good source. Um, but he, you know, he said that he had heard someone ask, if, if, if you were to die tomorrow and, and people were to to question whether you are a Christian or not, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Uh, and I think that's something that I have in mind uh, when I think about social media. When somebody comes to your, your Facebook page or your, your Instagram, uh, and if they were to look through that, would there, would there be any indication that you follow Jesus or, or not? Um, because I think what the purpose of social media is is to present ourselves to, to people around us mm. in some way. Uh, now the the benefit of that is maybe up in the air, uh, but but I think it could be. A For the really record, I think social media is a net negative <laughs> in the sense that I think there's positive components. I think the negative far away is the bad, but that's my opinion. But I think we could use it as a tool the way we're doing it now. Sure. And, and, and I, I pray I pray the quarantine gets lifted soon. So. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but I think we can use it as a tool and, and a means by which we are are 
preaching the gospel. We are yeah. showing our Christian witness to, to those who, who interact with us on social media. Um, and so I think if you if you were to look at, at your Facebook page or your Instagram page, I don't have Instagram, so I don't know what your thing, uh, would there be any evidence that you were a Christ follower? And, and if so, um, good, and let's keep it that way, and let's continue to interact with, with this, with this situation that's going on in a way that, that points people to Christ. Yeah. Uh, not to the the latest conspiracy yeah. or whatever, but but are we are we most concerned with with glorifying God and and showing people the gospel of Jesus? Yeah, yeah, because I think yeah, the the big issue is not just merely uh, do people know that I'm a follower of Jesus, but what do my actions say about Jesus? What do they think about Jesus and His message, and what Christianity as a whole has to offer? Uh, in terms of hope for the world, uh, especially at a time like this, yeah. um, and if if the the theme of our our posting is it's worse than you think, uh, so hunker down, uh, you know this is going to be bad for a while. If that's the extent of of what we're saying, uh, what we're saying might might be true, um, mm-hmm. but we're we're leaving out the most important thing, and and I think we need to be careful about that. Yeah. Finally, how do we continue to be the church? Uh, that's something that we're, we're, we're talking about in all of this, but, but as far as uh, our, our vertical church mission statement is yeah. gather, equip, making disciples as we go. We're going to edit equipped. it. No. <laughs> yeah, we're going to take that. Uh, but how do we continue to make disciples as we gather, equip, and send during this time where we're gathering is at, at best challenging and yeah. impossible? Yeah, kind of going back to I think we really have to think outside the box and get creative. Uh, and the good news is we live in a day and time where a lot of that's possible, yeah. right, in terms of with technology like we're even using now, uh, where they didn't have that in the past. And, and, and kind of, you know, to what you are saying earlier about you know, we retain our identity as the people of God because, you know, people, the church is not, you know, building or service, it's a people, and that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is the people of God who have been bought and purchased by the blood of the Son and have been united together uh, into the, the body of, of Christ. Uh, however, we can't carry out one of the primary functions, uh, one of the most basic functions of a church right now, uh, and that is and that is to gather. Uh, and so we have to really think uh, creatively about how do we how do we still practice all the one another's that we see in Scripture, and and be the body of Christ that we're called to be. Uh, and so, like you know, like the idea of praying for one another. Well, that still applies even though we're quarantined. You right. Know? Um, and so we should pray for uh, our brothers and sisters uh, across the globe, and particularly uh, in our local church context, especially those who uh, may be elderly or immune compromised, or um, those who are kind of serving on the front lines right now, uh, and doctors and nurses and first responders who don't have you know the the the, the privilege of just chilling in their PJs uh, at home. They have to be out there uh, caring for for those that are hurting or being affected by. By this uh, this pandemic, and so I think we should pray for one another. And it, I think, obviously, we can do that uh, without letting anyone know. But I think too, maybe we could go beyond that and and actually call people and pray for them, or, or let them know that we're praying for them, or ask how we can be praying for them. I think that can be that can be huge. Um, uh, we're still called to encourage and exhort one another in the truth, and so uh, we can still do that. It yeah. just might look a lot different than than we normally would. I know three of our community groups did Zoom yeah. meetings last night, which I thought was really yeah. encouraging. I heard from all of them that it went great. So uh, I think that's something that a lot of our groups are going to be doing. And I think that's a great way not not only to pray together, to, to gather as, as much as we're able. Yeah, uh, we're gathering But also, also an opportunity for those community group leaders to, to exert and, <laughs> encourage yes. and exhort one another uh, with, with, the, with God's word. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, I, and I'm, I'm like, I don't like that. It's not my preferred method of communicating to people. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, either, but I think I'm learning too. Like, it, we have to get over our preferences, yeah. and and given the season that we're in, we need to think about how do I how do I love my brother and sister, even if it means doing something that I'm not used to, like this, uh, or maybe don't don't normally do, um, so that we can can help spur one another on towards you know, Christ likeness. And I think we can still tangibly help one another. Kind of yeah. going back, just like we would for our community. Uh, I think even, you know, Paul would talk about, you know, do good to all men, especially to the household mm-hmm. of faith. And um, so there are those within our own church family who have needs, whether it's, you know, going on runs or whatever. Yeah. I think we should be the first to, 
to step up and help. You know, if someone loses their job in in your community group, I think we should be the first to say, hey, uh, you know, we we can help you financially if you need it. Um, and we're going to do that individually. I think we're going to do that corporately. As Joe mentioned, you know, we we realize that this this could be hard for a lot of people in terms of uh, not just emotions uh, and and um, and health, but also financially. And so being prepared to to step up and be the church that God has called us to be. In fact, we've always held up that that picture in Acts two and Acts four, where it says that no one had any need among them because when people had excess, it supplied their lack. And I think we have a real opportunity, probably now and in the coming months, to step up and and uh and be that church so yeah yeah i'm excited uh there are a lot of challenges that we're facing with this this is weird uh it's not my favorite thing that we've ever had to do as pastors um but i'm thankful that we have this this opportunity um but i'm also excited uh i i think that we we have an opportunity here as as a church to um to really look different uh, to really be holy, really be set apart from yeah. the people around us, um, that that makes me really excited. Uh, I think, I think that that God can use this to to open doors that would have otherwise been shut uh, to to get us into places like we've been looking for for somebody to contact at Henrico County for, to serve a need <laughs> for, for months yeah. and, and got nothing back, and now yeah. within a week we've got you know multiple opportunities. Um, so, so I'm hopeful that God is going to use this not only to, to grow our church, but to grow our, our service to our community and, and how we can reach the lost around us too. Um, and so, so I want to, I want to wrap up, um, and just, just with a reminder, please send us in your questions, um, or, or topics. Um, we, we, we actually want those. It's not just something that we're saying to, to sound nice, um, we, we value you guys and we want to hear from you. Um, and if you have questions, I appreciate those of you who have interacted with us as we've gone through this. Continue to do that, please. Um, we, we hope this is helpful. Uh, that's yeah. our goal in all of this is not just to, to do it because other people are also doing it. Um, we, we hope that this is an opportunity for you to to feel connected and as, as, as much as possible. Yeah. I know Josh does not feel that. <laughs> uh, but, but we want this to be, to be an opportunity to be as intimate as possible through this. Um, so please continue to send in those questions, continue to interact with us as much as we can. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about eschatology. Uh, one of the, yeah. one of the things that's been tossed around a bunch is, is this a sign of the end times, uh, of Jesus return? So, we wanted to take some time to interact with that question. We, we may have time for some, some other topics or questions if you guys want to send those in as well. Yeah. But in particular, if you do have questions, specific questions about, uh, you know, what this means, is this an indication, like you, Joe, saying the end times, or is this fulfillment of specific prophecies, et cetera, uh, go ahead and send those in too because I might be able to interact with those uh, yeah. explicitly uh, next time. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. We are going to sign off now, but uh, until next time, later. Later.